everybody, welcome to our video lecture on sexual dysfunctions. So let's get started. Before we get too much further along in the semester, I want to start the conversation about competency. Now we're going to talk about competency a lot between now and the end of the semester, and you should have already read the article on the Plicit model by now, and we'll be going more in depth into that the next time you see my face. But to start us off, let's just make sure you understand the difference between multicultural competency and specialty competency. Multicultural competency comes from the ethical code and reads as follows. Personal values. Counselors are aware of and avoid imposing their own values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Counselors respect the diversity of clients, trainees, and research participants and seek training in areas in which they are at risk of imposing their values onto clients. You all know this. You all know that multicultural counseling is required of all counselors, particularly any counselor that has signed the ethical code from ACA for their licensure. So when we think about multicultural counseling, it's if you have a client come in and they are of any demographic difference than you or value system different than you, you would not turn away that client solely because of their value system or because your value system is either different or that there's a risk that you might try to impose your opinions or thoughts onto their worldview, their lifestyle, their behavior, whatever. The difference is, and the one that we don't always talk as much about, is specialty competency. Now for specialty competency, it even says in specialty competency that, that multicultural competency is required for all counselors but that we don't practice outside our specialty. So what's the difference? The difference is, is that specialties have to do usually with presenting concerns or with anything that would require extra training on your part other than your standard master's degree with an internship. So what are some of these specialties? Well, I like to think of trauma as a specialty, particularly if the presenting concern is the resolution of trauma because there's a lot that you need to know about what's going on in the brain when someone's experiencing a trauma and then what some of the cutting edge technology is on how we treat trauma. But there's lots of specialties. When you think about human sexuality, I've already mentioned this, that if you're going to be the lead clinician who helps someone through a gender transition, then you would need more than just this one class in human sexuality. But there can be others. And when we think about dysfunctions, specialty competency definitely comes into play. You can probably help lots of clients who come in who have either very mild cases of these or who have dysfunctions and have a partner who's really active and on board and ready to assist, but some of these will require some extra training. Now we're going to talk more about how specialty competency plays into the Plicit model, but real nice and quick. If you think about it, the last two letters implicit are IT, and they stand for intensive therapy. So any person who needs intensive sex therapy to resolve their presenting concern, that's probably going to be a referral to a specialist because one class in human sexuality does not make you a sex therapist. Now that we've clarified competency, let's talk about sexual dysfunction. Now, if you'll remember, I mentioned that the DSM is not based on Masters and Johnson's arousal model. Instead, they're based on Kaplan's arousal model. And that Kaplan looked at Masters and Johnson's model and said, mm, that's nice guys, but you've kind of missed a major key part of psychological sex, and that would be psychological desire to have sex. So Kaplan added desire on the front end of the model and then collapse Masters and Johnson's first two stages of excitement and plateau together into one arousal phase. They both kept orgasm and then deleted the resolution phase from Masters and Johnson. So Kaplan's model only has three stages. And because of that, the DSM only has sexual dysfunctions that are in those three stages. Now there is a fourth group of sexual dysfunctions, but it's pain not resolution. And that's how we know for sure that the DSM is based in Kaplan. Depending on what textbook you're using when you watch this video, you may have a textbook that says that it's based on Masters and Johnson's model. And that's wrong. It's based on Kaplan's. But when we look at the DSM, there's also three different categories of sexual disorders. There's gender dysphoria, which we'll talk about briefly later. There is 
sexual paraphilic disorders, and there are sexual dysfunctions. In DSM-4, these were all in the same chapter, but there's lots of changes between DSM-4 and DSM-5. And fortunately, everyone who I'm talking to now has been trained on DSM-5. That doesn't mean, though, that all of your future supervisors and coworkers aren't aware of all of the changes. So you may still have some people who get lost, but that's fine. The real key here is what's the difference between a dysfunction and a paraphilic disorder? So let's look at that. Dysfunctions are based on functionality. So if someone is not functioning sexually in the way that either they are accustomed to or the way that we understand sex from these models and they are experiencing distress because of that, that would be a sexual dysfunction. A paraphilic disorder is when someone is sexually aroused by things that are not culturally typical. Now, we are gonna talk about the paraphilic disorders later. But there is a difference between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder. A paraphilia is just a fancy word for when someone is sexually aroused by things that are not typical for their culture. The DSM gets all wordy about this and talks about non-genital fondling or, you know, objects and stuff like that. But the real shorthand is it's not usual in that person's culture to be sexually excited by whatever the thing is. But a paraphilia is not inherently a disorder. There's lots of people who are sexually aroused by lots of things, but we don't go around labeling them as having sexual pathology until two things happen. And the two things that have to happen are they either have to be majorly distressed or experience some kind of impairment or some kind of consequence for their sexual, atypical sexual arousal and or they have to violate the consent of others. So because of that, most of the paraphilic disorders, things that are actually diagnostic codes, are when people violate other people's sexual consent rights. And that means that most people who have paraphilic disorders are actually offenders. Now, it's a little bit more complex than that, and we will look at the paraphilic disorders momentarily. But the key difference here is that just because someone is sexually excited by something that's odd or atypical, it doesn't guarantee that they have a pathological disorder that needs to be identified in counseling. And that those two things are very different than sexual dysfunctions because sexual dysfunctions are just about how your body and your mind work together to function sexually. Let's look at some other specific details about diagnosis then. So as I mentioned, the DSM is based on Kaplan's model. And so because of that, we have desire dysfunctions, arousal dysfunctions, and orgasmic dysfunctions, which map out on her three stages. So for desire dysfunctions, there are two, male hypoactive and female sexual interest disorders. Hypoactive means too low. If your body temperature is hypothermic, it's too low. Hyper is too high. So the disorder we're missing here is hypersexual. Back in DSM-1 and 2, there was nymphomania, um, but we haven't used that term in a very long time. So there's actually not a diagnostic code for someone whose sexual desire is too high. Is it possible that someone's sexual desire could be so high that it causes problems? Absolutely, but we don't have a diagnostic code for that. Hopefully, as master students in a counseling program, you're already aware that the DSM is flawed and doesn't have di diagnostic codes for everything that you will see. In this case, we might want to talk about impulse control disorder or any of the other ways that we're trying to diagnose sexual addiction because there is also no sexual addiction diagnostic code yet. We also have two arousal dysfunctions. The female sexual interest and arousal disorder maps on both of Kaplan's stages, and we'll look at that in a second. And then there's also erectile disorder. When we look at orgasmic dysfunctions, there are three. Female orgasmic disorder, which is when women do not orgasm or do not orgasm routinely. And then two, for men, delayed ejaculation, which is when men do not ejaculate routinely or regularly. And then premature or early ejaculation, where men orgasm too quickly or quicker than they desire. So again, we're missing something. We're missing women who orgasm too quickly. Why is there one for men and not one for women? That goes back to a very old problem when we think about sex. If you think about women as always being the receptive partner, 
and you are postmasters in Johnson and believe that women, all women, are multi-orgasmic capable, then if a woman orgasms too quickly, she can continue to be penetrated and, who knows, might even have a multiple orgasm. Now there's a problem there. One, not all women want to continue to be penetrated after they orgasm, so if they orgasm too quickly, it could actually cause distress. The other problem is, is that not all women experience multiple orgasms. Yes, it's possible, mainly because their refractory period in Masters and Johnson tends to be much shorter than men. But remember, Masters and Johnson was presenting averages, and there's also ranges that are still considered healthy and normative. So just because some of the women they observed were able to do that, doesn't mean all women do it every single time they engage in sexual activity. And in fact, as we know, many women actually don't report having a lot of orgasms with their partners anyway. So could I orgasm too quickly and then want to discontinue sex and get into a pattern where this happens routinely? And then maybe I don't even want to respond to initiation because it just is too much of a problem. Absolutely, that would just be a female version of early ejaculation for men, but we don't have a disorder for that. And again, that's because of some of these underlying biases that come from our understanding of sex. And then the last one is your pain-based dysfunction. We used to have two pain-based dysfunctions and I'll talk about what they are because they still exist in the ICD for health diagnoses. But for a psychological diagnosis, the only one we have now is genitopelvic pain penetration disorder. The other part that's important to pay attention to when we think about diagnoses of dysfunctions is what's considered the criteria D, rule out. So the real key here is that we have the medical community and the psychological community. And the medical community also is looking at sexual dysfunctions because as we've discussed, a lot of sexual arousal is dependent on things like blood flow and hormone levels and even just tissue structure. So I, as a mental health counselor, can't do anything about those sorts of things. Those would be medical conditions. So they have medical sexual dysfunctions. But sometimes people experience sexual dysfunctions and it has nothing to do with their physical body. It has nothing to do with blood flow. It has to do with what's going on in their mind. And so those become psychological sexual dysfunctions. But we have to figure out which one it is for our clients. I can't help you if your blood pressure is too high or low. You'll need to go to a medical doctor. And a medical doctor can't help you if you're experiencing such a high level of performance anxiety that you have difficulty maintaining an erection. So how do we make sure that clients get to the right Professional. That is what Criteria D helps us with. And I find that Criteria D tends to be the part that students have the hardest time understanding. So let's make sure we clarify this. And then afterwards, if you're still at all confused, make sure you post to the FAQ board so we can clear it up. To have a diagnosis in the DSM, we have to rule out five things. The first is a non-sexual mental disorder. Basically, we don't double whammy our clients. If you have a client who has major depression and meets all of the criteria for major depression, and because of that, they have very low sex drive and have what appears to be a lack of interest in sex, you wouldn't also give them a sexual desire dysfunction because their sexual desire dysfunction is only because of their depression. And if you resolve their depression, their desire would return. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, is this sexual symptom a symptom of another major disorder? And if so, don't give them both. The second one is consequences of severe relationship distress. Basically what this means is that if people have a very chaotic, tumultuous relationship, perhaps even are on the verge of divorce, of course the sex is bad. So again, you would not double whammy them. The source of the pathology there you can think of is the relationship, not the person. Along that line, the third one is other significant stressors. If someone is majorly stressed, then of course there's an impact to sex. We've already talked about the relationship between stress and sex. So we wanna make sure that we help that person with whatever is the significant stressor because that again is the source of the pathology. Basically you need to think about it is that there are symptoms and there are sources. And yes, to some degree, 
all we're doing when we diagnose someone is look at clusters of symptoms and then label that symptom cluster a name that we can all agree on and then we have ideas about what is the source that's causing that symptom cluster but at the same time you don't want to just look at one symptom and decide that guarantees that there is a single source or that it is a source of a sexual nature in this case if someone is super stressed because of all sorts of things in life then what they need is stress management and if your treatment plan is written for stress management and you're trying to diagnose someone with a sexual dysfunction first of all insurance is going to look at you like that's not what you do in that case why is your treatment plan so odd so you always want to make sure that whatever the client needs clearly fits with the diagnosis because again symptoms come from sources the fourth one is effects of a substance or medication and the fifth one is another medical condition this goes back to the fact that sometimes sexual dysfunctions come from medical problems. If you're on a blood thinner and can't maintain an erection, again, my license doesn't help you with that at all. You're going to need to talk to a medical doctor. Same thing's true for even something like an SSRI. We know that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do affect sexual desire. So again, you're going to need to go to see your psychiatrist and talk to them about that because as an LPC, I can't really help you with medication issues. And the last one is again, medical conditions. If this person needs a medical do doctor because the dysfunction is in the body and not again in the mind, then they need a medical doctor. Basically, as counselors, your number one task if a client comes in with a sexual dysfunction, you want to send them to a general practitioner first who's going to rule out the medical stuff because you just want to make sure they get to the right professional. And we can't help with those things, just like those doctors can't help with the stuff that's going on in their psyche. The last part that's important about diagnosis is time and specifiers. All sexual dysfunctions have to occur for at least six months. And this is to make sure that this is a pattern of behavior and not a random occurrence. Everybody has a bad day. We don't diagnose a single bad day. We want to make sure this is a pattern. And the last part is specifiers. DSM-5 is full of specifiers. Every chapter has specifiers. The first one is lifelong versus acquired. And the second one is generalized versus situational. The nice part is as long as you know what those words mean, you know what the specifier means. Sexual dysfunction that is acquired came after a period of normal functioning. And one that's lifelong is your whole life. One that is situational is in certain situation, and one that is generalized is in all situations. Just like generalized anxiety disorder is when you are anxious about lots of things as opposed to just one thing. Hopefully you can brainstorm that then the combination that has the worst prognosis would be generalized lifelong sexual dysfunctions. This could literally mean somebody who has never orgasmed under any circumstances. So someone who doesn't orgasm in any partnered sexual behavior of any kind with any partner, nor through masturbation, and that they have actually never had an orgasm. That's what it would mean to have those two specifiers together. And you can see just from my example, that's a very complicated situation. That might mean that even if you are competent to treat somebody for some sexual dysfunctions, that if they have that particular specifier, you might want at the very least a consult with a sex therapist or to refer them to a sex therapist. Even though I have a lot of experience working in this field, it doesn't mean that even I have the specialty to treat everyone. That's why we always have to pay attention to our specialty competency and make sure that we refer responsibly when our clients need us to. In our next video, we will actually talk about the specific disorders briefly, uh, and that will round out our video lecture.